Hoxie's 4, home to a startling variety of environments ranging from sprawling glaciers, crumbling lava tunnels, damp fungal forests, and even caverns covered with abundant bioluminescent plant life. If nothing else, the one thing consistent in all these biomes is the fact that they are as dangerous as they are beautiful. As part of the mining teams that brave these sprawling environments, you're no doubt familiar. But the real question is, are you prepared? In part 2, we will be exploring each of the biomes of Hoxie's 4, to speculate on some of their features, but most of all, to prepare you for future expeditions into their depths. The drop pod is ready. Climb aboard, team. Before we jump into the first biome, let me give you a brief rundown on the natural history of Hoxie's 4, or our current best guess, that is. Hoxie's 4 was once a huge rocky planet with massive subterranean oceans beneath its seemingly featureless surface. The planet remained sealed and harbored conditions for life to slowly develop and thrive in its pitch dark tunnels. There's even evidence that aquatic megafauna once called it home, the top of a complex food chain in the ocean planet's ecosystem. This all changed when at some point, a huge asteroid on the collision course of the planet's orbit made a direct impact with it. The hit was so dead center that it completely changed the planet's geography to this day. The underground oceans on that side of the planet were vaporized and sent into and out of the atmosphere. Any water that survived was drawn to the other end of the planet by sheer force. The density of the material on the asteroid caused the planet's center of mass to change, causing it to be tidally locked in addition to forcing most of the ocean to freeze as it burst through the weaker parts of the outer crust, exposed to the vacuum of space. This left a previously stable ecological situation in complete chaos as some of the areas were drained of water, sifted through the sediment and stone, leaving behind huge mineral deposits. The core was even sent moving to one side of the planet briefly, melting and scorching everything in its way as the lava flowed through the caverns, eventually making its way to the surface on the other side of the planet, opposite the impact. The evidence of this can be seen in the massive floating chunk of the planet, still held by its gravity but in low orbit as a kind of pseudo-moon. This obviously killed off most of the dominant life on the planet, leaving open space in the remaining ecosystems for any creature tenacious enough to survive this newly hostile world. I'm sure you know which creature won that battle. The places you explore on missions all bear the scars of this cataclysmic event in Hoxie's history, as a story told in rock and stone. I could talk more about other conjectures I have, but we'll save that for another time. Let's get to the biomes, shall we? First on the list is the Crystalline Caverns. These aptly named caves consist of giant crystal formations and solid stone walls. While it can occasionally have rooms dotted with electrified crystals that can shock you with arcing bolts, this biome has the least environmental hazards to worry about. That isn't to say it's not interesting. The crystals here took millions of years to form under precise, stable conditions, those being high humidity, pressure, and heat. It may not look hot, but trust me, you'll be sweating down here. Bring a towel. They are prime examples of the beauty Hoxie's 4 can muster, that is unless they block your way. It may take eons for them to form, but only seconds to break them. <laughs> yeah, you don't care. Anyway, one interesting fact is that this biome is located nearby the radioactive exclusion zone. They have similar geologic makeup, the only difference being the compound found in the crystals having properties that shield this area from the radiation. The walleyes do tend to break through the surface here though. Ugh. Oh, and while it does rain here, I will warn you, we don't know what that liquid is. It's not all water. We do know that, so uh, don't open your mouth when it rains, I guess. When heading here, I'd focus more on the mission and hazards to inform my loadout of choice. One relevant thing to consider is having a driller since there are some tight tunnels that might need to be dug through due to cramped conditions or obstructing rock formations. If Rocky Mountain Stout's on tap, I'll usually grab it when heading here. Other than that, enjoy the view and not having to use your personal flares as often. The salt pits are another place with few hazards that require consideration before a mission. I will say, be careful of the stalactites, they tend to fall when hit with explosives or bullets. They can do huge damage when they hit the ground, do with this information what you will. Since it is a breeding ground for Kronar shellbacks, it could be beneficial to consider some armor breaking perks for getting through their shells. 
and maybe some area damage or damage over time in a crowd control build to quickly deal with the younglings. Just be aware, gunner shields do nothing to stop rolling coronars, so be careful when cornered by them. Bring an extra water bottle and something to carry some red salt back with you for breakfast on the rig though. You'll be seeing a lot of it, and it can sometimes make nitro hard to find on cave walls, so use your laser pointer often here. One interesting fact that's stated by the miner's manual is that this biome used to be a massive underground lake that has since dried up billions of years ago. This lake is what remained of the ancient oceans, collecting all the salt in one place before it too dried up. This gives us an interesting look into the distant past of Hoxies, perhaps giving us a look at a form of deep sea ecosystem before the planet began to dry. Shellbacks specifically may have been a species of giant aquatic isopod that have adapted to living in this dry environment, even turning it into their nesting grounds. Glyphids seem like they are a relatively new species to the region, perhaps preying on the shellback young to survive. We have no real idea. Biological research is extra hard when your choices are being crushed by a chitinous sphere or being torn to pieces. We'll probably stick to mining team mission recordings for now. The fungus bogs are a place of rich biodiversity, if you count 7,000 different species of fungus and lichens. The region is located at a higher elevation and directly above the magma core, in the middle of a giant aquifer. There is no pooling water located anywhere in the caves because the heat below causes much of it to turn to steam and to break through the surface and vents all over the region. The warm, moist environment created by the evaporated water running down the cave walls is perfect for the growth of fungi and plant life, and for ruining your gear. Fun fact, the substrate here is composed of a huge mat of lichen and mold that goes deep into the nutrient-rich soil, making it slick and unpleasant to walk on, I'm sure. Not to mention the smell. Like it says in the manual, we're almost sorry we send you down here. Almost. The bogs are one biome that can demand some forethought if there are no other major stresses on you. The sticky goo on the ground is sometimes very abundant, so it pays to have unstoppable or dash on you to mitigate its slowing effects if you have to run through it. It also affects glyphids, so you can use it to lose them if you're running away from a swarm. One issue is the poisonous fungi that grow all over the place. The chip damage you'll take from these can warrant taking increased shields or even perks like Shield Link or Sweet Tooth to offset the damage. They're relatively avoidable though, so it's a low priority problem. Also, driller axes can clear them out very quickly with the shockwave from being thrown near them, so it's a good idea to bring those if you can. It won't even use up an axe charge, letting you retrieve it after you clear them yeah. out. Keep a lookout for those glowing bioluminescent plants, by the way. If you hit all the glowing bulbs on them, they'll light the area for you for a time. Saves on flares. Hmm, what else? Mushrooms. Mushroom, 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 mushroom. mushroom. Guys, I, okay. Mushroom, I mushroom. <laughs> I, mushroom. Get, I get it, okay? Mushroom. What I was trying to say is don't eat them. We haven't found any edible specimens yet. No, those tall ones are not giant morels. Just don't, okay? If you can handle that, you'll probably be fine. Next we have the radioactive exclusion zone, an area of Hoxies that, as its name suggests, is bathed in dangerous gamma radiation. Our best theory for how this place came to be is that it may be the ancient remains of the massive asteroid impact from several billion years ago. This asteroid contained huge quantities of activated uranium and is still giving off this energy to this day, transforming both the landscape and biology in the process. This impact may also be responsible for the strangely varied geography of Hoxies IV, the ensuing pressure from it forcing a section of the planet's core into chaos and creating the magma core region as a result from the displaced molten material. The asteroid left very little in its wake, stripping the caves of all but the most adaptable extremophiles, causing strange forms of life to begin growing, feeding on the energy from the radiation. This, of course, didn't stop the glyphid swarm from reaching down here. Their fast evolution solving the radiation problem very quickly and making them immune to its effects even. The exclusion zone is called the exclusion zone for a reason. It's dangerous for any mission. The notable damage that the radiation can do to you from both activated uranium crystals and the mutated exploders or praetorians almost demands that you bring along elemental insulation to lessen the hurt. If the creatures can adapt to these situations, then so should you. The radioactive Praetorians also warrant the use of crowd control builds that can turn them away, freeze them, or simply kill them quickly to prevent the AoE they admit. Other useful perks include Shield Link, Sweet Tooth, See You in Hell, and even Veteran Depositor for the increased damage reduction. 
This biome also sports three hit terrain, so anything that helps with mining quickly can be useful. Oh, and to make up for some bad intel in the past, I did say breaking the crystals here from the base is how you got rid of the effect. And even though that does work, destroying the core of them gets it done much faster. The more you know. Home to giant coral formations and an abundance of prickly plant life, the dense biozone is another biome of Hoxie's 4 that offers more insight into its time as a planet which hosted a vast subterranean ocean. The plant life here seems to be distant descendants of ancient coral species that formed the interesting structures seen throughout this region. Since then, the drying of the planet's ocean caused the caves to empty out and become an underground equivalent of an arid forest. The dry climate of the caves gave birth to a variety of hardy plants similar to cacti that want nothing more than for you to leave them alone or suffer some unfortunate punctures in your suit. Though it may seem dry here, the ambient moisture from the remaining plant life feeds moisture into the ceiling that can be cycled into an occasional rainstorms that completes the loop. The giant coral structures all over its caverns are not in fact dead, just a species that have adapted to life in the thick air of Hoxie's caves as a stand-in for the aquatic environment their ancestors thrived in. The dense biozone is an interesting case of a biome that's right in the middle of extreme and mild as far as dangers go. The hostile flora in the area can still hurt you quite a bit, so damage mitigation perks like shield link and veteran depositor are still useful, but it's hardly your biggest problem. Clear out the cacti if you're planning on staying in one spot for a while with them. They can bring you down if you aren't careful. One thing you want to prepare for here is vertical mobility. The caves here often require you to traverse vertically segmented caverns with multiple levels. Zipline angle for gunners should be set higher in my opinion. Use a scout's help to your advantage here too. You should be extra vigilant not to miss high up minerals. It's easy to miss a patch of nitra just out of view. The omnivorous glyphids love this region as a nesting ground, probably due to the easy access to the water stored in the flora here, which has over time caused the plants to develop more and more devious strategies to deter would-be predators and space miners. Located near the outer crust, the glacial strata is the vast remains of an ocean that once permeated Hoxie's 4. Now located in a massive ice sheet that has settled partially on the surface of the tidally locked planet. When the planet settled back into its orbit after the asteroid impact, the ocean froze quickly as it moved closer to the surface. It cut huge gashes into the rock face, burrowing deep and shattering the mineral rich crust it came into contact with. This explains why we still find minerals buried in the strata's ice. Of course, while you would think the arthropods of Hoxies would die out here, you'd be dead wrong. Ever adaptable, many species found ways to evolve a resistance to the biting cold. Even developing bodily fluids similar to antifreeze compounds to thrive in these temperatures. Plant life even manages to remain in clusters around thermal vents on the ground where the geologic activity of the mantle beneath still manages to break through. Fun fact, the cold resistant glyphids here will avoid the steam vents. Perhaps the evolution they underwent causes them to dislike warm temperatures? Maybe you should reintroduce them. The strata has one standout feature that I always want to prepare for, and that is the deep snow patches found all over. It may not seem like a big deal, but the slowdown in the snow can get you killed when running from swarms. Bring unstoppable and you can run freely and not waste time having to clear snow to move faster. The other issue is if you should bring fire or ice weapons. Fire can be effective on Goo Bombers and Praetorians since they ignite quickly, but keep in mind they also extinguish faster too. Cryo weapons work just fine for swarms, but be aware you will waste more ammo on the cold adapted bugs, the fluids in their bodies resisting the temperatures much longer than normal. The choice is yours, just be aware of the limitations to save ammo. Dash is also a nice boon here, letting you avoid being killed by bugs when slowed by one of the frequent blizzards. Watch for black ice too, it makes movement a bit more challenging but speeds you up if you run on it. You'll be faster than the bugs, so it's a nice way to outmaneuver a swarm. Oh, and bring gloves. I can't tell you how many times we've had miners lose fingers down here because of simple negligence. Don't let that be you. At one point, the science team assumed the growth of typical tree-like plant life was not present on Hoxie's 4. We were proved very wrong when an expedition team stumbled across the hollow bough. Typical plant life is not exactly the best way to describe it though. The organism that makes up nearly all of this environment here is a porous, bark-like organic superstructure that seems to have grown from what was originally a large burl on a tree. Or what passes as a tree on Hoxies. It's possible that when the planet went under the massive change after the asteroid impact, whatever tree-like organisms were living here adapted rapidly to that change. 
growing haphazardly and combining into a superorganism to absorb nutrients and water from everywhere around them. This can be seen in some of the tree species such as quaking aspens to much less extreme degrees. The hollow bough grew to such a size that it is now less of a plant and more of a biome and substrate to other organisms, including the parasitic thorny vines that evolved alongside their host to cover most of the region. Other notable species are the corpse feeders found burrowing into the bough's bark, hiding when anything gets too close. It has been speculated that this biome is where the Mactera swarm originates from, and these feeders could be their larval young. Either way, it's a good idea to get rid of them. They're gross. Similar to the glacial strata, the rapid growth of the bow picked up many hard minerals buried in the planet's surface as it grew ever closer, and we are here to do it a favor by picking those unearthed gems out of its bark. The hollow bow could be said to be functionally like the dense biozone as far as hazards, except you could argue that this place is much worse. You'll be taking constant chip damage from the vines here, so it's a good idea to take at least one of the aforementioned perks to mitigate or heal the damage back. Increased shields can also help. You also have to prepare for the vertical terrain, so any form of mobility that would help with that would be invaluable. It's also insufferably dark here, so you might find yourself using more flares than normal, so make sure to ration them out for when you need them. Oh, and watch your surroundings. The vines sometimes get a bit antsy when you get close to some of them, and they will try to fight back. Good thing you're no leaf lover, eh? Located adjacent to the glacial strata is a bastion of abundant plant growth that forms the unique and beautiful Azure Weald. It's notably cold here, bringing to mind the upland surface forests of colonized worlds. The area manages to thrive due to being in the ancient path of the glacial sheets that scraped through the caves, upturning the substrate and leaving behind silt and clay that could serve as the rooting grounds for many different types of bioluminescent plants. This environment now seems much like a rainforest, dense with life and just as deadly as the term would apply. Unique wildlife resides here in the form of curious hexwing niffers, a close relative of the much more annoying fester fleas, and the mobula cave angel that glides effortlessly through the air, filter feeding on flying insects and the zooplankton drifting in the thick atmosphere. Fun fact, it can be closely associated with the genus mobula of rays found on terrestrial oceans, earning its namesake. Another thing found only here in the Weald is the Magic Zones, created by the glowing auras emanated from certain unique rock outcroppings. Our research is inconclusive, but these may be gathering places for airborne zooplankton, the magic aura caused by their bioluminescent glow. Regardless of what they really are, their effects are apparent, the blue type causing significant damage reduction to any living being affected for a short time, and the teal green type curiously causing short-lived low gravity and movement speed increases. We don't know how they do this, and we don't know what else it does to your body. Enter at your own health risk, I suppose. The Azure Weald is an interesting biome in the sense that there's even less true environmental dangers than even the crystalline caverns. The main issue here is not being able to see very well due to the darkness, and the fact that the walls and vegetation do an annoyingly good job at hiding the mission critical assets you and your team are there for. If Dark Morkite is on tap, I suggest taking it to ensure a mist vein of Morkite won't ruin your day. The large open spaces and rolling smooth terrain of this biome may also need you to bring mobility like longer zip lines or a perk like second wind to get across. If you get the feeling you're being watched here, then you are. Don't let the wield's beauty fool you. You're being hunted as always. On the other end of the scale as far as the abundance of life goes is the Sandblasted Corridor, a windy, dry region of the planet that is the ancient leftovers of the sand and silt layer left behind by the Great Hoxie's Ocean. All the water has been drained from here, leaving nothing but smooth sandstone passages sculpted by the ceaseless wind traveling through them. One thing this biome has in common with another is the appearance of giant xenoform fossils that are occasionally- Hey, editing Searvent here. So, uh, I was gonna say that there were xenoform fossils in this biome. I searched far and wide for these things to go in the footage, but for some reason the Sandblasted Corridor is the only biome I couldn't find them in. So, uh, I, I've, I've nearly gone insane looking for them. So enjoy this footage of the bones from- other biomes that they decided to show up in. Uh, bad intel ruining my day again. Hey, get, get the guys from the science department on you. Yeah. Exposed from the sand, similar to how they emerge from the fungus bogs, perfectly preserved from the anaerobic environment beneath the surface. 
These skeletons may in fact be the remains of giant aquatic creatures from eons past, but we still can't be sure until we find a way to bring a specimen back for study. Which is costly and has nothing to do with the company's goals on Hoxie's 4, so I doubt that will happen anytime soon. Still, the look of these bones reminds me of something. I know I've seen something like this before. Never mind. It's not important. Uh... The Sandblasted Corridor can have some of the largest, most open caves out of all of the biomes on Hoxie's, even more so than the Weald. Again, Second Wind comes in handy. One consideration, though, would be the use of hover boots to help save yourself from falls that are caused by the numerous wind vents that can occasionally blow you across the cavern to fall to your death. Also, don't take Rocky Mountain here. It's a waste of time since the substrate is already fragile, taking only a single hit to mine. And no. No matter what anyone tells you on their fifth smart stout, zero hit terrain mining is a myth. The armor and heartstones might be psychic, but you sure aren't. The only other thing to worry about here is Nyaka cave trawlers. These things are nasty and will try to take you away from your team, so the use of heightened senses might be a good idea here. They can occasionally down you in a couple of hits in higher hazard areas, so they are not something to be ignored by any means. You don't want to see what happens to those who get dragged under by these things, never to return. Oh, and you can use the explosive spores here to your advantage in fights, though we're still trying to figure out why exploding on contact is a very good strategy for reproducing a, for a plant, but you know what? It's Hoxies. Just shoot them and try not to think about it too much. Lastly, we have the Magma Core, the depths of hell itself. The use of the word core in its name is a bit misleading. It's nowhere near the core of the planet. Instead, being the epicenter of the geothermal disturbance left over from the asteroid impact in the planet's ancient past. The impact displaced enough molten material from the core to send it shooting through the crust on one side, superheating the region and melting any materials not resistant to the heat. This created vast lava tunnels of igneous rock that you would see in any place where geothermal activity is high, with active volcanoes in the area as well. The lava has since mostly receded deeper into the mantle back to the core, but has left plenty of evidence of its presence behind with the unique cave formations and patterns in this biome. Contrary to what you would think, there are a number of extremophile plants that call this place home, feeding off the heat and using chemosynthesis to survive against all odds. The area also seems to be a favorite place for glyphids to leave dreadnought eggs behind, the behemoths being nearly immune to the heat and their underlings fiercely defending the growing monsters. It goes without saying, I hope. Bringing elemental insulation here is a must. You'll be taking constant damage from the magma, fire events, geysers, and quake open crevices. Any other damage mitigation perks are welcome here, in addition to better shields. Also, consider not taking weapons that cause terrain carve when detonated, or at least be careful with them. The more explosions that carve the floor you use, the more chip damage you'll take from running over it. The ground here is still saturated with molten material, only being walkable since the surface layer has cooled enough to be solid once more. One little fun fact though, you do actually move faster over exposed magma, so you can use it to lose bugs if you sprint over it in a bad situation. Don't tell management though, they might install a heat element in your boots to motivate you to move faster during missions. Don't want to give them any ideas, huh? The magma core progressively gets more dangerous the longer you stay in it. So move quickly and get your mission done before you end up playing the floor as lava with a horde of angry insects. And that's all of them. So far, at least. You may be wondering, why does this map in the space rig terminals imply that all the biomes are right next to each other and laid out nothing like the way you just said? I remind you that map was made for your convenience and not as a scientifically accurate rendering of the planet. I mean, am I wrong to say that dwarves don't really care about this stuff? and just want to kill bugs and move dirt? There's like, what, 10 of you still in this live broadcast on the rig right now? Doesn't matter to me, I still got my bonus for completing this course material for you. Our hopes are that maybe a few of you will look this stuff over and use the info on expeditionary missions to possibly find more biomes in the future. We'll keep you posted if that happens. Until then, I hope this guide helps you prepare accordingly when going back into those caves and maybe reflect on the incredible biological and geological diversity this horrible planet has to offer. That is when it's not trying to kill you. We'll be covering missions in the future. I want to say a big thank you to my patrons, The Flannel Man, I Like Turtles, and Infrared. You guys are awesome. Also, special thanks to Just a Cat and Octopane for the help with the footage. Some of that stuff was hard to find. I stream at twitch.tv at Searvend if you want to come hang out. I'll be there.
Until next time, rock and stone. Listen, if, if, if you're still here, uh, I wasn't lying about those bones. They haunt me. I see them when I sleep. I dream of nothing but bones. At this point, I'm really starting to doubt my sanity, but I'm not sure if it's the Xenoform fossils or just the work schedule. If you find them, I need a screenshot or a clip, anything. I'm putting a 3 million credit bounty on it, wired directly to your company account just as soon as management allows us to make transfers between employees. In the meantime, it's back to the corridor for me.